Thanks. So I want to thank you guys for coming tonight and missing the new episode of Grey's Anatomy. So I'm going to go quickly so we can all have one watch it. Okay, so this is called creating sexy rainwater harvesting. And you'll see why in a little bit. Traditionally, rainwater harvesting has been kind of a, uh, something where it hasn't been that attractive. And nowadays, with some of the technologies and construction techniques, we can actually create rainwater catchment systems that actually complement your backyard, turn it into something beautiful. So what I want to do is share with you two main issues that are coming up. First one, supply and demand. So if we, in order to, to speak to this and address it correctly, we need to look at what's going on in this world. You know, think globally, act locally. The issue that we're having right now is not anything more than an alarm bell for a greater issue that is worldwide. Why is this happening? Well, in order to understand that, you need to go back and look at the way that things used to be. If you look in nature, 99% of a natural environment, if you go in Algonquin Park, 99% of it is permeable. Then what happened is we started clearing the land, and we started creating this rural environment where we started draining it off. If anybody here knows a local farmer, they can tell you that pretty much you can't get a corn crop in these days unless you put a big old pipe in there and drain that off into a ditch. So they started getting this 60% surface runoff because the farmers wanted the excess water off their land so they could actually farm it. And then we ended up in this suburbanization, what we see around here, and we have 70% impermeability because we have sidewalks and backyards and tightly knit grass and streets and parking lots. And then if you go downtown Ottawa, you see they only get 1% infiltration. So all that water can't actually go back into the ground and recharge the aquifers. So areas that were wetlands like this were, were actually sinkholes for the water sources to recharge aquifers are now looking like this. So how's the water to get back in the ground? And this is why you start seeing flooding issues. We see areas where there's wildfires burning everything down out in Alberta, and yet they're drowning in Manitoba. It's because the water can't get back into the ground naturally like it normally does. Well, let's look back in history. There's some ancient solutions. The Greeks and the Turks had it figured out. Back then, there was no municipal water systems or anything like this. What happened is, if you wanted to build a house, you found yourself a nice piece of impermeable rock, and you carved out, why don't you do this by hand? No machines. You carved out of the rock a basin, then you built your house on top of it, and you harvested the water off the roof into that basin. And in periods of drought, you have drinking water and water to water your garden with back so you can actually eat. They took personal responsibility for their water. And that's what we're talking about here today, is taking personal responsibility for your water consumption and the, your water footprint on, the, on the, uh, the local system and the local ecology. There are modern methods now. We don't have to actually go dig holes out of rock in, in, in Barhaven and Manitou in order to <laughs> harvest rainwater. There are rain barrels. Seems like you can't keep a rain barrel in stock if you're a retailer nowadays. But these methods are okay and they're a start, but they're only part of the solution. And here's why. If you have a thousand square foot roof on a house, which most of these houses have more than a thousand square foot roof, every time it rains one inch, you get 750 gallons of water. That's a lot of water. If your rain barrel only holds 50, maybe 75 gallons, most of that water, 90 to 95 percent of it, is going and just going right down the drain. So, another application then would be another solution then would be to have larger application systems and get bigger tanks, right? You need more water, bigger tank. But there's a bit of an issue with that. Some of the backyards are very small; they're very cumbersome. They, they need huge craning equipment to get them in. I like this guy here who kind of stuck his big rain barrel underneath the deck as if nobody has noticed. <laughs> Well, we're going to get to that in a second. There are solutions where you can actually harvest rainwater and actually have it be a thing of beauty in your backyard. We're going to share that with you in a second. The second issue that we have here in the city of Ottawa, and beyond this local supply issue, we have a much, much greater issue that is going to become increasingly important. And this is where you can make the biggest difference with the solutions I'm going to share with you today. And that is controlling urban runoff. Who here does not know that we've got issues with urban runoff? and stuff ending up in the Ottawa River. Nobody. It's all in the news, all the time. But again, who's responsible that, for that? We are. We buy houses with roof lines and eaves troughs and curbs and sidewalks and parking lots and municipal sewer systems, and we let it flow right down the drain and don't take personal responsibility for that water. 
So, areas that look like this, with all this crappy, ugly, smelly looking snow in the spring runoff, start creating huge, huge runoff issues for us. And they create flash flooding, erosion damage, and fish kills in local rivers and streams, because all those hydrocarbons and all that stuff that comes off of vehicles ends up, you know, heavy metals ends up in local bodies of water, and we end up with ecological issues like this. And it's an awful lot of water. If you look at an average city, I don't have to go through all of this, but an average city that's 20 by 50 miles wide on a one inch rainfall with the permeable services, with its 99% permeability, will produce 17.4 billion gallons of water. So our municipal engineers, they say, okay, well, storm sewer is the answer. Yes, but what they're doing is they're deferring the issue. This is a picture I took with a camera on my phone of a big storm and I saw the water drain popping up because there's so much taxation on the system. As we have urban sprawl and it goes out and out and out, the system can't handle it anymore. And you get areas like this guy down on Belmont Avenue and had a bit of a hard time because the sewers backed up us, the sewer was in that neighborhood, and the whole area flooded with a spring runoff rain. So the system can't handle it. The pipes are designed for a certain size and as the city gets bigger and bigger, they have to push more and more water through these drain pipes to get it down to the Ottawa River. So engineers say, oh, well, that's easy. We've got to get it into the Ottawa River. Why don't we just build a storm pond and collect the water? And we see these all around here. Great idea. But all they're doing is deferring a liability. Because what happens is they're designed as settling ponds. So what happens is they end up sledging up like this, and you end up in a situation where you've got expensive dredging costs, and these costs get really high. And I, here's an example of it could cost somewhere about $500,000 to actually dredge a pond. If you look here at the city of Ottawa, we currently have about 150 stormwater ponds, and they all need to be dredged, and the costs are going to end up being about $200 million. So, would it not be easier to have people hang on to that water on their own property and then? release it later on, or actually reuse it, capture it, filter it, and reuse it. So there are solutions. This was supposed to be sexy rainwater harvesting, wasn't it? So the easiest way to do this is to create a bioswale, okay? Capture your rainwater in a low-lying area in your property, and plant it. We talked about that a little earlier. Mr. Flanagan was talking about how we actually capture the water and use species, and I think Ed's gonna talk about some native species a little later on, Plants that will actually love periods of flood and then drought. And you can create beautiful little gardens like this in the corners of your property and hang on to that water and not allow it to actually take off and turn it into something of beauty. The best solution is using rainwater harvesting systems. This is one company, there are many. There's one company that's uh, a company in Chicago that's developed this rain exchange system, which I'm going to talk about. But there are ways that you can actually capture that rainwater and capture it like you would with a rain barrel and combine it with a rain garden to get the two concepts put together. All right, so, five minutes, I'm good. So what we're looking at doing is capturing, filtering, and reusing the water. And then you can use this water in your landscape for flower beds, washing your car, topping up pools, ponds, protecting from wildfires, we actually won't have one, one uh, business that actually uses this to protect for fire protection because they're not near hydrant. And in some municipalities, I don't think in the city yet, but for toilet and laundry water supply. This is very popular in Europe. So my question is, would you rather the big ugly tank, like this, or this? So how do we do that? Well, there's different, you can actually combine your rainwater harvesting and, and have a, a water feature with the rainwater harvesting unit that'll actually filter the water for you so that it's biologically available when it comes time to, to use it in your landscape. So you can have beautiful streams like this or waterfalls like this in your landscape combined with rainwater harvesting, decorative burns, bubbling columns. These are all rainwater harvesting systems. Beautiful ponds even. And who wouldn't like to think of beauty in their landscape? Right? So, I told you that was a sexy, this is the, that's the end of the sexy component. So this is how it works. 
Basically what you do is you need to pre-filter your water, okay? So we pre-filter with what's called a downscope filter here. And that's because off of your roof there's all sorts of debris and gunk and everything that's going to collect with that. So you want to capture that little net pre-filter. And after that you pre-filter it, it's going to run down. And well, you can see the pre-filtering here. Let's just quickly talk about this. Basically what it does is it pre-filters the water and it actually buries beneath your downspout filter, so it's actually decorative. You don't see it, it's there below the ground, but it's doing its job. And it captures that first flush and lets it flow into the ground so it's not dumping all sorts of crud into the water feature. And then there's a little green up that you can clean out. So it's, it's a first flush filter. And then the water travels down a little corrugated drain pipe into a basin. And the basin is lined, just like you would at a pond, and filled with these things called aqua blocks or eco blocks many different manufacturers of them. And they're like plastic cages that create holding capacity. If you were to fill that basin up with gravel, basically a, a cubic foot of gravel will hold about 2.2 gallons of water, whereas a cubic foot of air, which is what a block like that has in it, before it's filled with water, will hold about seven and a half gallons. So you can create in your front yard a 500,000, 1,500, even a 2,500 gallon basin that's holding all this water in there. And it would hardly have any footprint at all because it's beneath the surface of the of your lawn or your garden. Then what happens is the water would recirculate through a water feature of some sort to keep it biologically available so it doesn't stink, you know, funky smelling with anaerobic bacteria. And then after that, you would also put in an overflow area. So if this ever did get too full, like it probably would have this April, then this overflow area over here is like a French drain that'll actually allow the water to permeate back into the ground if you've brought on too much. And these can all be sized with a sizing calculator and put into your landscape um, based on the, the capacity of your roof line. So here's an example of a fountainscape that was done. Here's an unassuming looking suburban in the front yard. And they had a bit of a drainage issue here because every time it rained all the water off the garage would pump and flush this out and put all kinds of debris down the this down the driveway and onto the street. So the apple blocks were laid out to form this little basin. And then it was carved out and lined and a snorkel vault was put in to house a pump. And then the apple blocks were put in and the gravel and the decorative, these little decorative columns, they wanted this in their front yard. And then basically every time it would rain then, the water would capture it inside this little basin below. There's a pressure pump built into it as well. Behind this, is that a wood woody cedar? Did I get that right in? Did I get that right? Okay. Wood woody cedar. See, there's very good talk. Back here is a tap. And it's an on demand tap because there's a separate little pump in there. These little bubbling columns are an energy efficient pump. And every time you turn on the tap, you've got a water supply that's coming from a 500 gallon basin. That's like burying 10 rain barrels in your front yard in a tiny little space. 10 rain barrels that look kind of ghastly. So, if you're concerned, people say, well, what, what can I do then? That sounds really cool, Nick. Great idea. What can I do? Well, here's the thing that I've noticed that people can do most. First, is you can install a rain garden, a rain barrel, or a rainwater harvest that consists of your home or business. And do it not just because there's a water band and you need water this summer. Do it because it's the right thing to do. And then others will follow suit. Talk to your landscaper your landscape professional, your contractor or builder about rainwater harvesting. See how they incorporate into it. If you're building a new house and it's a LEED certified building or a business building, you can actually get LEED points for putting these types of things into construction projects now. I think it counts for about six points for uh, silver LEED certification. You can speak to your local, provincial, and federal officials and demand sustainable changes in water policies. Say, so they will give you what you want. That's, they're there to serve you. That's why they're public servants. They don't want to make it difficult for you, they want to help. Share what you learned today with a friend, neighbor, family member, or co-worker. And also invite you to share this with somebody else. I do this for free. And if there's anybody that you have out there that would you'd like to hear this message, the abridged version or the longer version, I'd be more than happy to come to speak to them.